You know, maybe we don't really have free will in the way we ordinarily think think we do, or maybe there aren't really facts about good and bad and right and wrong. Maybe they're just, you know, projections of our subjective feelings. It is still a deep, deep mystery where it comes from, you know, after, despite our great and developing scientific understanding of the brain, we still lack even the beginnings of an explanation of how electrochemical signaling is able to produce an inner world of colors and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us enjoys every second of waking life. I mean, I think we're not really at first base on how to think about consciousness as a, as a society. And we need to, as I say, rethink the science that's bequeathed to us by Galileo to do that because it, it's not gonna be just business as usual because the, our whole conception of science at the moment is it's all about account, accounting for public observation experiments. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Philip Goff. Philip is a philosopher known for his work on consciousness and the philosophy of mind, particularly for his defense of panpsychism, the view that consciousness is a fundamental feature of the universe. He's an associate professor at Durham University in the UK. His books include Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness, and Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. So Philip is an advocate of a controversial but very interesting theory of consciousness known as panpsychism, and he defends it as well as I've ever heard it defended. But before we get there in this conversation, we rehearse what may be familiar ground to some listeners. We talk about the hard problem of consciousness as opposed to the easy problems of consciousness. We talk about the problem with materialist explanations of consciousness. We talk about the problem with dualist explanations of consciousness. Philip challenges my narrative about scientific progress in a really interesting way. We talk about the global workspace and integrated information theories of consciousness. We talk about the principle of parsimony in science and how it relates to rival theories of consciousness. And finally, we get to Philip's case for panpsychism. I really enjoy this one, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, Philip Goff. Okay, Philip Goff. Hello. Great to meet you. Lovely to meet you, Coleman. Looking forward to chatting. Thanks for coming on my show. Yeah. Happy to be here. Okay, so um, your, uh, your, your faculty profile says, and I quote the first sentence, my main research project is trying to work out how consciousness fits into our overall theory of reality. So I see you set a very modest goal for yourself. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. I guess, I guess I've just always been obsessed by consciousness as long as I, back as I can remember, actually. I mean, I think, I think there are a number of, the, of these phenomena that philosophers find troubling because they, they're hard to fit into our standard scientific worldview. Other, other examples are things like free will. You know, how do we reconcile human freedom with a, the deterministic or near deterministic world we seem to get from physics? Or value, facts about value. How do facts about good and bad and right and wrong fit in with observable scientific facts? Um, but I think consciousness is the, is the most fascinating because in all these other cases, it's always at least an option to maybe deny the phenomenon exists. You know, maybe we don't really have free will in the way we ordinarily think, think we do, or maybe there aren't really facts about good and bad and right and wrong. Maybe they're just, you know, projections of our subjective feelings. But when it comes to consciousness, the idea that that doesn't exist, you know, the idea that nobody's ever felt pain or see, seen red just seems intolerable even for the, the wackiest philosophers. So consciousness is, is fascinating because it's, it's so hard to deny it exists, and yet it's so hard to fit into our 
standard picture of the universe. So that's why it's always kept me awake at night. So like you, I've been very interested in the puzzle of consciousness for a long time. And that was arguably my main interest when I was a philosophy major at Columbia. Right. But uh, for those in the audience who may not get so hung up on this issue or may not have thought of it, what's so puzzling? You know, human beings, we, mm -hmm. we can feel. Uh, we're not just machines, although computers now can do every day more and more of the things that we can do and robots can do some of the things we can do. We're not robots. We feel and we think yeah. and there's something it's like to be us and it's always been that way and presumably animals also have an interior experience mm -hmm. and things like tables and chairs don't. Yeah. What's so puzzling? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are a couple of ways into this. Um, I mean, one thing is it, it just as a matter of fact, I think most people will agree, it, it, it is still a deep, deep mystery where it comes from. You know, after, despite our great and developing scientific understanding of the brain, we still lack even the beginnings of an explanation of how electrochemical signaling is able to produce an inner world of colors and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us enjoys every second of waking life. Um, so this is what David Chalmers famously, famously called the hard problem of consciousness, this challenge of explaining where consciousness comes from, how, how brains manage to produce it. And so I think it's generally agreed that, that we just really haven't got the beginnings of an explanation there. So we know, I mean, we know what we have made progress on is working out which bits of the brain, which bits of, which kinds of brain activity go along with which kinds of conscious experience. Um, there's still very little consensus, actually. There are a number of different proposals and... Um, people fight over them but we've made some progress so we know that we know as a matter of fact that certain kinds of brain activity goes along with conscious experience and we know even in some specific cases which kinds of brain activity go along with which kind of experience what we're totally clueless on is why why should that be and you know digging a little deeper if you if you just think about the wonderful rich story we get from neuroscience about what goes on in the brain, you know, neurons firing, action potentials, chemical signals, uh, this very complicated story of chemical interaction. On the face of it, it seems that all of that could have gone, gone on completely in the absence of consciousness. Not, n none of that story seems to mention feelings and experiences and colors and sounds and smells it's just this complicated story of electrochemical signaling you know if you, you, you said just now um that we are conscious and of course we are but if aliens came from another planet that were physiologically very different to us and they studied us from the outside poked around in our brains it's not obvious they'd know we're conscious they they, they might just think we're complicated mechanisms there's it, it it's uh, that the whole scientific story we currently have doesn't seem to mention consciousness at all, really. I know there's a famous science fiction story, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, where um, I think aliens visit Earth and then report back to their alien overlords. Uh, and they're trying to convince their fellow aliens that uh, and they are silicon-based life forms. They're trying to convince people that we met these carbon-based life forms and they're made of meat. And I'm pretty sure that the meat is capable of thinking. <laughs> and they go, hold on a second. Don't be crazy. Meat couldn't possibly <laughs> think. Surely they're, the meat is controlling some silicon-based thing that is doing the thinking. And he's like, no, no, it's the meat that is doing the thinking. They're meat 100% true. We looked at 100% uh, through. Um, which is which is a, a really clever way of yeah uh, um, inverting the intuition here and and saying there's nothing uh, we we just have no idea why it is that yeah. the chemical reactions in our brains or 
you know, the, the physical reactions in our brains produce an associated experience. When we can study similar chemical reactions inside a beaker in your science classroom, and we're pretty sure there's nothing it's like to be that reaction. So what explains the difference between matter that becomes conscious and matter that doesn't? So let's just look at some of the obvious explanations. One is materialism. Mm -hmm. Materialism, the idea that consciousness can be explained in terms of the physical processes in the brain. What's wrong with that? Yeah, so that, that that is still probably the dominant view, although only just the uh, there's this people might be interested in the um the Phil Papers survey, which was a a survey of uh English speaking philosophers throughout the world, their opinions on on uh, philosophical matters. Do you believe in God? Do you think we have free will and so on? And on consciousness, fifty two percent um held a material inclined to a materialist view uh and 32 percent were opposed and then the others are sort of agnostic or don't like the question so it is the majority view but it's it's a it's it's a fairly close run thing it's not brexit but um (laughs) so um but yeah so and, and you can see the attraction i think many people think of this as the scientific view um you know this is and so i think that's where it gets a lot of its credibility Although I would actually dispute that association, maybe when we've got onto some of the other views, I think actually all of these different options on consciousness are different philosophical options, and all of them are equally compatible with with the scientific data. So, so I don't think really this is a choice between rival scientific theories in the way that some people sometimes think. But anyway, I'm 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 rambling. Let me come to your question. What, what, what exactly is, is wrong with materialism? So, the, I mean, the first thing is what we've already said, I suppose, that despite decades of, um, of trying to solve Charm, David Chalmers hard problem of consciousness, of trying to explain consciousness in terms of uh, complicated electrochemical signaling, we've just got absolutely nowhere. And it's not just that it's not this explanatory project is not completed. It literally hasn't got anywhere. There isn't a single conscious experience uh, that we've managed to explain in terms of electrochemical signaling, right? As I say, it's not like the science of consciousness has made great progress in identifying which kinds of brain activity go along with conscious experience these are sometimes called the neural correlates of consciousness which kinds of brain activity but it's made absolutely no progress on this the aspiration of the materialist to explain why so that's one one thing to point out and you know i i would say there are just other philosophical options that are making more progress but dig in a little deeper you might say okay you know maybe we just haven't got there dig in a little deeper i i think we should we shouldn't be surprised that our current uh, scientific approach, that physical science, as we now conceive of it, struggles to explain consciousness because it was designed precisely to ignore consciousness. So this is what I argue in my book, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness. Quick plug. Um, I trace this problem actually back to the intellectual foundations of the scientific revolution. So Galileo in 1623, the father of modern science, he wanted science to have a purely mathematical language, something we kind of now take for granted. But this was quite a radical innovation of Galileo. He said, right, from now on, our fundamental science is going to be purely mathematical, what he called natural philosophy, what we now call physical science. But he appreciated, I think, that you can't capture the qualities we encounter in our experience in the purely quantitative language of mathematics. You know, you can't capture in an equation that deep red you experience as you watch the setting sun, these colors and sounds and smells and tastes. You can't fully capture them in mathematical language. So Galileo essentially says, well, if we want science to be mathematical, we have to take consciousness outside of the domain of science. So he, so there's this radical division in Galileo's worldview. There's, there's two domains. There's the domain of science with its purely mathematical properties, 
size, shape, location, motion, and as the domain of consciousness outside of the domain of science with its qualities of colors, sounds, smells, and tastes. And this was the start of mathematical physics, which, as we all know, has gone incredibly well. And it's, you know, produced such incredible technology. And I think 400 years later, we're now going through a period of history where people are so blown away by the success of physical science that it makes them think, oh, this is the truth. You know, this is the full story. It's going to explain everything, including consciousness. Well, no, the reason it's been so successful was because it was designed to exclude consciousness. So I think if we now want to bring consciousness back into the scientific story, we need to rethink that conception of science that was bequeathed to us by Galileo. So it's a bit long-winded. It's interesting. No, that's okay. Uh, so I think what just occurred to me to frame it this way is that science has been encroaching bit by bit on what used to be explained by immaterial phenomenon, right? Uh, the evolution of life, for example, the um, disease, right? Some people would just get struck by disease and other people would seem totally fine. And the rational explanation at the time before science might be God, right? Or that you must have done, right? Like okay, my sister went down to the, to the river or my sister forgot to pray today and I remembered to pray and she ended up getting sick and I didn't. So it's quite logical to think that prayer prevents sickness, especially if that's something I've been taught by my local witch doctor or whatever, right? Yeah, sure. Turns out through the scientific method, we found material explanations for what used to seem like immaterial phenomena. And that's that track record has proven extremely effective. We've invented medicine, we've invented technology, we've explained the weather, we've explained why a hurricane happens here but not there. And it seemed like this steady march of materialism explaining erstwhile immaterial phenomenon would just keep on going until it marches right up to why it feels like something to be this body but it turns out it's just run into a brick wall and it hasn't explained that at all. Physics hasn't explained it. Biology hasn't explained it. Chemistry hasn't explained it. Um, psychology hasn't explained it. Psychology just presupposes it and, and explains smaller, but still important phenomenon. So, so um, in a way it's, it makes sense that people would expect materialism to be able to explain the, uh, you know, consciousness itself, but, but it really hasn't. And so some people have been tempted by the dualist explanation. Maybe just dualism is true. So can you explain what is dualism and what do, does it have any philosophical defenders at this point and what do they say? Yeah. If if I could just come before I get to dualism, just I, I think you really nicely articulated the, you know, a very popular uh, narrative, um, and it's I've debated a few times now with the neuroscientist Anil Seth. Uh, we debated actually at the Royal Institute of Philosophy annual debate uh, last November. You can watch on YouTube if you want, um, and and this is very much the argument he gives. You know, look. We used to think you couldn't explain life, and then we just got on with the science, and we did it. And you know, you could give another analogy, like you eloquently just did with with disease and so on. Uh, so, isn't it going to be the same with consciousness? Um, and I just, I, I think there are a couple of important disanalogies here. I mean, it, one is the, the point from Galileo that I just articulated that our entire scientific approach of the last 400 years was premised on ignoring consciousness. But another, perhaps more fundamentally, um, what I, this isn't just a scientific problem. And, and the way to see that is that consciousness is not a publicly observable phenomenon. Um, n n n you, you can't, I can't look inside your head and see your feelings and experiences, right? Um, now, you know, scientists are used to dealing with things you can't observe. Uh, 
fundamental particles or quantum wave functions or maybe even other universes some some scientists take seriously but there's a crucial difference in all these other cases we theorize about things we can't observe in order to explain what we can observe this is the whole point of science right we're trying to explain publicly observable observation experiments in the unique case of consciousness, the thing we are trying to explain is not publicly observable, right? We do, consciousness isn't something we discovered in a looking down a microscope or in a particle collider. We know about it in a very different way. We know it through our private, immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. You know, if you're in pain, you're just immediately aware of your pain. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't know it existed. So... So it's a very, very different, and, and so that contrasts totally with life, right? With life, it was about ob stuff we can observe, right? Plants and animals, we c they're a complicated observable behavior. We were trying to explain observable behavior. Th that's, what's, that's what physical science is good at. You postulate mechanisms to explain behavior. Ultimately, you postulate the laws of physics. Physics is, that's what it's designed for. But it's just a totally different explanatory project in the case of consciousness, which we're not trying to explain publicly observable behavior. We're trying to explain these invisible private feelings that we're immediately aware of. So the success of physical science um, in doing what it does, I don't think gives us any reason to think, oh, materialism is, uh, is going to be true about consciousness. It's, it's like saying, oh, you know, science has been really good, so it... It's going to explain morality. You know, it's going to explain whether abortion is permissible. You know, we can do an experiment and we can decide whether abortion is permissible. That's, it's just a different kind of question. Um, anyway, so so th that was just commenting on the, the life analogy. But so these kind of worries, as you say, might lead pe lead a lot of philosophers to um, to dualism. Uh, dualism being the view that consciousness is out is non-physical outside of the physical workings of the body and brain perhaps it's in an immaterial soul that's closely connected to the body but is but is somehow distinct from it so this you know i mean this is probably the most popular theory of consciousness among in human history you know m many cultures have had people have had dualist intuitions many religions um but there are still proponents of dualism um Perhaps most famous, w w I've already mentioned him, the Australian philosopher David Chalmers, who coined this phrase, the hard problem of consciousness, which really drew people's attention to the mystery of consciousness. But he is also actually a dualist. Now, he calls himself a naturalistic dualist because he thinks consciousness is not physical, but he, wants, he thinks we can bring it into the domain of science. He wants to see it as a law-governed uh, scientific phenomenon, even though one distinct from the from the physical processes. Uh, so he's, you know, if you even ever meet David Chalmers, he's the most kind of secular atheist I've actually, guy. I've actually had him. Oh, I've, yeah. had, I've had him on this podcast. Oh, yeah. cool. Very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. So he's not at all a spiritual kind of woo-woo kind of guy that you might expect from being a dualist. But yeah, so... So, so that that would be the dualist position, which many people dissatisfied with materialism turn to. Um, I don't like either position myself, but <laughs> so yeah. So how does the dualist respond to to the objection? So you know, the dualist says mat there's material stuff that physics and chemistry studies, like atoms and quarks and molecules and so forth, and then there's consciousness stuff it's like a different kind of stuff it's not like the stuff you can grab it's it's you know the ghost in the machine right it's like the soul in the body how do they explain yeah. the fact that every time i have a uh you know one or more likely too many whiskeys which is a totally physical thing whiskey is just a f physical liquid so far as we know Although maybe there's some soul in the whiskey, some soul stuff as well. Um, every time I have a physical uh, cup filled with ethanol, it changes how my consciousness feels. How does mm -hmm. the material stuff touch the ghostly soul stuff so reliably 
in such a law-like way. Yeah, I'm a big fan of whiskey myself. I get really happy on whiskey, <laughs> but then I just feel terrible the next day. Anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, so, well, this was, as for a long time, been the classic objection to dualism, uh, famously framed by Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who, um, yes. who Rene Descartes, to, to, um, yeah, the uh, famous duelist in history, was, was the private tutor of, and um, she used to torture him by making him get up early, which he wasn't used to, which killed him in the end, I think, at the age of 42 of pneumonia. pneumonia. But I had quite an interesting life take. Tell that to my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. No, no good getting people up in the morning. Um, yeah, so, so, so she worried about this, you know? She worried, how can this immaterial, non-spatial, non-physical stuff connect with the physical brain? And, uh, and also connecting with what you just said, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle famously mockingly dismissed dualism as the ghost in the machine. So the way David Chalmers solves this problem is by postulating special laws of nature that connect up the physical brain to non-physical consciousness. Which he calls them psychophysical laws. So these are basic principles of nature. So you've got the laws of physics, right? That, you know, scientists try to get as simple as possible, the basic equation of physics. So Chalmers believes in them, but he also thinks that there are these extra fundamental principles that connect consciousness to the physical world in two directions. So, so when, um, you know, when I'm seeing you now, actually you're down there, my camera's up here. I'm just pretending to look at you. But, you know, the light hits <laughs> my eyes, makes changes in my brain, and then changes happen in consciousness and vice versa. You know, my consciousness, there's pain in my consciousness that makes changes in my brain and causes me to scream out or so, and so on. Uh, so it's the psychophysical laws connecting the two up. And Chalmers think, you know, it's going to be in an, a largely empirical task um, working out what they are. So we said earlier, it's the task of one task of the science of consciousness to track the neural correlates of consciousness to work out which kinds of brain activity go along with consciousness. But then we've still got the why question. It's at that point that Chalmers plugs in these psychophysical laws to answer the why question. Um, now, you might think it sounds a little bit like cheating, you know, like you're basically just saying it just happens, you know, you're just postulating these laws and that's it. But, mm -hmm. you know, Chalmers says, I think kind of fairly, even though I'm not a fan of dualism, I think he's, he's got a good, res a fair enough response on this point. Well, that's what everyone, everyone has to stop somewhere. Wittgenstein famously said, explanations have to end somewhere. Uh, I say this about three times in my book. Explanations have to, in my new book, explanations have to end somewhere. You know, ev you, might stop at you might stop at God, or you might stop at the Big Bang, or you might stop at physics. Chalmers says, well, this is where I stop. You know, physics and these psychophysical laws. And we need them to explain consciousness. That's just my stopping point. Interesting. So does he believe that their psychophysical laws govern the causal relationship between physical stuff and consciousness stuff? Yeah. Is that right? I mean, in his, his early days, David Chalmers, he, he, he was what we call an epiphenomenalist, which is just a fancy name for saying consciousness doesn't do anything. So he thought the brain mm -hmm. activity creates the consciousness but the consciousness just hangs around there and um, doesn't right. actually impact back on the brain. So my pain right. doesn't actually cause my screaming or my conscious thoughts don't cause what I'm saying now. Uh, so the psychophysical laws just go in one direction. I think he's now not so sympathetic to that view for various reasons. Like it's puzzling how to make sense of how I'm managing to talk about consciousness. If, if, conscious, if my consciousness... You know, I can talk about my conscious experience. How is that possible if it doesn't impact on my brain and therefore, you know, partially cause the movements of my lips? Um, so he's not so sympathetic. But yeah, so it governs the... Um, I think he's now more sympathetic to the views um, th that they go in two directions. Right. So does he think that there are a set of laws that govern 
how the stuff of souls behave right so yeah this is actually this is good point i I should have mentioned so is, is there laws of physics for consciousness ghostly stuff yeah so chalmers is is um not this is the other qualification i should have made i guess chalmers is unlike rene descartes he doesn't necessarily believe in souls he's not a substance dualist which is someone who believes in that the mind is distinct from the brain chalmers is rather a property dualist so the idea so that what what is the distinction between objects and properties so pro, so this cup is a is an object and its properties are its size, its shape, its color, its weight, its smell, right? So, um, so for Chalmers, there's just one, there's just brains and bodies, right? There's no soul, there's no spooky stuff. But some physical objects, like brains, have two, diff- two radically different kinds of property or characteristic. They have their physical properties, the neuroscience studies you know, the electrochemical signaling and so on. And they also have invisible consciousness properties, pleasure, pain, colors, smells, uh, and and they're just different kinds um, of properties. What governs which objects have both properties and which objects only have one property? Yeah, it's a good good probing question. I have to get myself into David Chalmers. Just to emphasize again, this is not my view. Just get myself into... Uh, yeah, D- David Chalmers view. Yeah, I, well, again, it would be the psychophysical laws. So the psychophysical laws would just. Det- so let's 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 take a concrete example. So so there, are, as I say, there are these various proposals for the neural correlates of consciousness. What kind of brain activity goes along with consciousness? Uh, actually, there's going to be at the um, the the ASSC, which is a big scient- the the big annual science consciousness conference um there's going to be there's an ongoing fight between the global workspace theory and the integrated information theory and at the moment they're Mm. they're working on what's called an adversarial collaboration where they Mm. they work together to try and design experiments that they would both agree um which you know which side would be right depending on how the experiment goes mm. anyway i'm ram- i'm digressing again let me come back to your point so let's let's just pretend for the sake of discussion that the integrated information theory turns out to be correct right that theory tells us that you get consciousness in a system when there's more integrated information in the whole system than in its parts so this so this cup probably isn't conscious because there's there's probably more integrated information in the molecules than in the cup of tea as a whole but what's striking about the brain is the way it stores information is really dependent on connections and integration so there's very high levels of integration okay so th- so that's that's one let's say that turns out to be right well then chalmers will say there is a fundamental psychophysical law in our universe that says when you get more integrated information in the whole and the parts, you get consciousness. And that's just a basic, basic, like a law of physics, like the law of gravity or Schrodinger's equation or something. It's just a fundamental law of consciousness. And, that- and uh, b- before we get to global workspace, what would the implications, if true, f- of that theory be for computation and computers and so forth yeah good conscious. question so if if integrated information theory is true basically computers are not conscious <laughs> if they're anything like computers we have now because unlike the human brain the the way computers store information is not so dependent on not as dependent on on the connections you um, mm. If you take out a couple of transistors, you don't lose a hell of a lot of information. About the br- regarding the brain, you take out a few neurons, you lose a lot of information because it's all de- you know. There's uh, 86 billion neurons, each connected to 10,000 others, l- yielding trillions of connections. It's all about connectivity. So even it, so, if if it, integrated information theory is correct, uh, even if we have you know computers that are you know, store huge amounts of information and pass the Turing test, which it looks like it is now imminent. Uh, I, you know, I've been interested in consciousness for like 20 years and 
There's been so many media reports that this computer passes the Turing test, which was Alan Turing, the father of modern computing, his famous test of whether a computer is intelligent. Can it fool people into thinking it's a human being? And there's always these newspaper reports. But actually, it, it has never been officially passed. But, you know, the, seeing the latest AI developments, I was at an AI summit in Stockholm a couple I of years ago. I have to think GPT-4 yeah. b- essentially passes it, or yeah. in spirit passes yeah, it at yeah. this point. I mean, I think there are c- yeah. still like a couple of glitches which can give it away in, in, the, in the proper procedural tests they have. But it, it does certainly look imminent if it hasn't been, been done already. But anyway... Um, Sorry, I'm digressing a lot tonight. But um, so, yeah, if IIT is right, even if you get a supercomputer that passes the Turing test, it will not be conscious uh, unless it's a very different... I mean, obviously, it depends what you mean by a computer, but what we tend to think yeah. of as a computer now, it's not going to cut it. So what is global workspace theory? Global workspace theory, uh, roughly, is the idea that... Consciousness is a matter of how information in the brain, how broad, how broadly broadcast it is to many different systems in the brain. So you get a lot, you know, a lot of systems in the brain are, are quite local and might just regulate breathing or something. You know, you don't have to think about your breathing or or your balance or so you get a lot of a lot of maybe systems in the brain that have quite complex information, but they're quite local and specific. Whereas other systems are getting and receiving information really broadly. Daniel Dennett famously called this fame in the brain. You know, that's this like information that everyone knows about or cerebral celebrity. Dan Dennett's very good at these Mm. kind of catchy phrases. So so that's that's the view of the integrated information theory. uh, Sorry, of the global workspace theory. Um yeah. In other words, that what what is brought into consciousness is that information, which is widely widely available to to many widely available many in the brain differences. as opposed to narrowly. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Obviously, there's lots okay. of different ways in which this worked out. It was originally designed by Bernard Bars, who was one of the early pioneers on consciousness, who couldn't get a job because he wanted to work on the science of consciousness. You know, for a lot of the latter half of the 20th century it was you know it was a great taboo to talk about consciousness because it was this weird unscientific thing and um Mm -hmm. you know it's only since the 90s really that it's partly because of this phrase by david chalmers partly because of people like bernard bars actually coming up with scientific theories it's become a it's become a serious scientific issue um i guess my, my what i want to press is that's all brilliant but it's not just a scientific issue we need to be aware of the philosophical underpinnings of this problem that make it very different from more you know more standard scientific challenges in a way in the past philosophy and science have succeeded when questions stop becoming philosophical questions and start becoming scientific questions right yeah because you know philosophy used to encompass everything from the questions we're talking about to what we would now call physics, chemistry, if you go back to, you know, Aristotle, they, they all saw, you know, because they had no tools to test things, um, or fewer tools to test things, they were really just like shooting from the hip with intuitions and logic and thought experiments precisely in the domain of physics and chemistry. And later those domains graduated from the philosophy classroom into the testable science um, classroom. So, I mean, in in some way, are integrated information theory, global workspace theory, are they candidates for having the hard problem of consciousness graduate into testable science, whether or not they succeed? That's a good question. Um, I, I think sometimes we can exaggerate. I think there's a lot of truth in what you just said. Sometimes we can exaggerate it a little bit. I mean, Aristotle did do a lot of observation and, um, you know, a, a, a studying the biological world in a lot of detail. So, you know, I think it's always been a mix. And, you know, um, a lot of the Islamic world, you know, did, did very good experimental science when um, Christian Europe was still in the Dark Ages. Uh, but anyway, but but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm nitpicking um yeah so so is 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're totally right. I think what we all... T- philosophy is what you have when the rules of the game are not fixed. Uh, you know, ultimately, we want... W- when you have solid foundations for something that everyone uh, everyone agrees with or there's broad consensus, that's when it becomes a science. So the subtitle of my book, Galileo's Error, is Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness. So th- that, that's very much what, what, I'm tr- what I'm trying to do is suggest how we could move towards this being... I mean, I think we're not really at first base on how to think about consciousness as a, as a society. And we need to, as I say, rethink the science that's bequeathed to us by Galileo to do that. Because it, it's not going to be just business as usual. Because the, our whole conception of science at the moment is it's all about... Account, accounting for public observation experiments and that is just mm. not what you're doing with consciousness i'm sorry that is just not mm. y- you're trying to account for this invisible thing that um you know is not publicly observable and science physical science at least de- postulates mechanisms to explain observable behavior uh whereas in the te- case of consciousness we're dealing with these subjective qualities, these colors, sounds, smells, tastes that can't be totally captured in that purely quantitative language. So we need to really, really, really rethink how we think about science. Not, n- uh, not to be misunderstood. I'm not saying we need to get rid of the science we have or do it differently. I'm not going to tell neuroscientists how to do their job. But we need to move, I think, to a more expansive conception of science. We, one that takes takes as our our foundational data not just the data of public observation experiments but also the private reality of consciousness as fundamental data points for our theorizing um i mean i go a bit back and forth on this in in the book i said you know we need to move towards a more expansive conception of science the way i tend to put it now and actually my new book is is just to say no no keep science it is but we need to rediscover philosophy and remember actually there's this broader project of philosophy in which science is embedded i think you know th- th- that's an important part of the project of finding out about reality um so so yeah I, so I, I i don't think i don't think things like global workspace theory and integrated information theory are complete theories of consciousness because o- o- as important as they are what they are doing is telling us as I say, which kinds of brain activity go along with which kinds of experience. That's brilliant. But that's not the end of the story. We ultimately, we want an explanation of why. Why does integrated information go along with consciousness if it does? Why does mm. data information that's broadly available go along with consciousness? And that's where we have to come to the philosophy is it is the materialist solution going to work out? Is the dualist solution going to work out? My own favourite view, which we haven't got on two pan psychism, is that going to yeah. work out? And 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 just I mean, just to make this point in 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 a slightly different way, one more time, that each of these philosophical options are empirically equivalent in the sense that you you're not going to distinguish between them with a with a with an experiment for any empirical mm-hmm. data. All of these theories, materialism, David Chalmers, dualism, my panpsychism, will just interpret the data in, dif- in their own way. So it's, it's not, so that's another, and perhaps a more straightforward way, I often start with that actually, perhaps a more straightforward way of saying this isn't just a scientific, we, we can't answer all the questions here with an experiment because we're st- we end up, mm-hmm. s- when we get to the why question, we're stuck with these different philosophical options that you can't distinguish with an experiment. So you just have to do some philosophy, try and assess them on their own terms. Before we get to panpsychism, your favorite explanation, I want to remind listeners of the conversation I had with David Deutsch. Uh, This reminded me of that conversation for two reasons. First, because David emphasizes the primacy of explanation as the purpose the goal of scientific thinking. Whereas many people would say science is only in the business of predicting reality, of coming up with 
objectively accurate models of reality. David Deutsch says no. Uh, prediction is uh, is very useful, but the ultimate goal of science is to create explanations of reality, to answer why things are the way they are, uh, and to explain. And he makes a very compelling case with examples of why science is about explaining rather than merely predicting. And you make the point that integrated information, global workspace theory, these sorts of, I mean, this whole line of thinking seeks to predict, uh, to come up with a model that predicts which neural processes are associated with consciousness. But really, you know, if either of them were true, it would not equal an explanation of why those particular neural processes are associated with consciousness. What, you know, why do they need to be conscious? What is the consciousness doing? Um, it, it would, it would just, it would just basically seem like the restatement of a mystery that we can now predict. Uh, yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it, actually. And I mean, I'd very much agree with David Deutsch on that point. I mean, and David Deutsch is a physicist. Um, a, 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 a good way of making this point is thinking about quantum mechanics, which is, you know, quantum mechanics in terms of the equations is our best scientific theory, our most experimentally supported and huge amounts of our technology are based on it pretty much everything uh i think with general relativity our other great theory i think it's just gps pretty much that depends on that whereas quantum mechanics is just absolutely everything so th so it, it, in terms of prediction what stuff does it's incredible the problem is n there's absolutely no agreement on what the hell that theory is telling us about reality what what's going on in reality to make that theory true and there are all these different interpretations um and some a lot of physicists get annoyed with that and they say um um you, it's, not, you know, it's not my job yeah it's, it's not my job this to isn't, decide between rival explanations it's not of real these science predictions yeah it's not real science no, uh, Right. If you talk to yeah, so in that way, yeah, would I you mean, say like rival interpretation of of quantum mechanics is a, is an analogy or or um, analogous to this problem of consciousness? Yeah, in in that sense, I don't want to exaggerate it. You know, of, I'm not particularly into sort of quantum theories of consciousness or anything. So sometimes it can be like, oh, these are both mysterious. Maybe so. I'm not I'm not trying to advocate a quantum theory of consciousness. I'm just saying, in the sense that there's these different interpretations of quantum mechanics of what is going on in reality that explains what's the that the equations work and you can't do an experiment or at least at this stage we can't do an experiment um to distinguish between them similarly with consciousness right so we've got this is global workspace theory right is integrated information theory about about which kinds of experience go along with which kinds of brain activity go along with consciousness even when we settle that you still want to know why is it is it because dualism is true is it because materialism is true is it because panpsychism is true we need the explanation so yeah i i think it's very analogous in in that sense and another and also analogous is that people now cannot get jobs because they wanted work on this thing in, in quantum mechanics what we call it philosophy of quantum mechanics physicists call it foundations of quantum mechanics and um you listen to the the best philosopher of quantum mechanics, David Albert, or Sean Carroll, who I've debated a few times. You, you know, I you, actually you, took David Albert's class at Columbia. Oh wow, fantastic! Yeah. How was that? Was it? It was dizzying and and incredible. <laughs> I'm jealous. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, they say you now you cannot get a job if you want to work on this. Uh, I think things and that that was how it used to be with consciousness, and um, but thankfully things have changed with consciousness. But uh, yeah. So we need to, and you know, you can understand why it is, right? People, you know, the te when you have wonderful technology, it seems so tangible and real. And if, especially if you're an experimental philosopher, it must be like, this is real shit. And, but we can't make these explanation questions go away. We, we, we can't make, we have to do philosophy. And sooner or later, 
we're going to have to face up to that, especially with consciousness. We're not going to make progress in consciousness until we realize you need to, to do philosophy to find out about reality. Okay, so again, one pit stop before panpsychism. Um, I think in philosophy and in scientific thinking, you'll often hear when you have two theories that predict the same set of, uh, that have the same predictions, you should go with a theory which is most parsimonious. And that word parsimony is some, sometimes seen as a synonym for simple, right? So like if I, if, if something strange happens, if I see a rock fly up outside of my window, my theory should not be that gravity has been overturned in the past few seconds, but only in the location of earth where the rock flew upwards possible. I mean, it un, improbable, let's say my theory should be maybe someone threw, threw a rock upwards and I didn't see it go down. Right. And that's somehow more parsimonious. And then there's, you can get into, I think, I think reasonable people can, have vigorous disagreements about which of two theories is more parsimonious, right? And and this is a problem in quantum mechanics because is it more pro parsimonious that probability is inherent in the physical laws of the universe? Like there are laws that are not law-like in the sense we're used to, but actually have probability built into them that they're, you know, God is rolling the dice as Einstein put it. Or is it more parsimonious that there are that we live in a multiverse and universes are constantly splitting every time a, a quantum event happens. It's like I could, one could sort of argue either side of that. So how do you think of the principle of parsimony and how do you think of that with regard to rival theories of the hard problem of consciousness? I think it's very important. Um, so you're totally right. I mean, I think people sometimes have a, a naive understanding of, scientific inquiry like you just do the experiment and get the data whereas for any scientific data that i mean in principle there's always an infinite number of theories that could account for the data and we we go for the simplest one um so i this for me is what was what rules out dualism basically i used to think actually i've changed my mind on this in in my book galileo's error i i suggested there were scientific problems of dualism that we know enough about the brain to know that char you know that that, that there is non-physical consciousness impacting on it and making neurons fire and stuff and there isn't a ghost in the machine but actually that the more i've talked to neuroscientists we've got a, in, a lot of interdisciplinary consciousness work here at my university durham um or many different kinds of scientists actually um Talking to con um, condensed matter physicists changed my view on this a lot. But um, actually, I, I just don't think we know enough about the brain to know that. To, it, feel, you know, it feels a bit ridiculous, kind of non-physical consciousness making the brain. It feels like a poltergeist playing with the brain. But actually, just as a matter of fact, I just don't think we know enough about the brain to rule it out. I think people just think it sounds silly rather than actually having solid scientific data to rule it out. So I so I actually think consciousness, David Chalmers style consciousness, is a coherent scientific possibility. I just think parsimony, on parsimony considerations, we should turn to other theories first, right? Why believe in two kinds of thing, physical stuff and non-physical consciousness, if you can just believe in one kind of thing? So um, so I think that would push us to one of the other two options. Uh, materialism, we've already discussed. I've said some reasons why I don't like that. My own view, panpsychism, I also think is, is more parsimonious than dualism. Um, well, because, I mean, to put it this way, dualism takes both consciousness and physical stuff to be fundamental and distinct, whereas the materialist just takes the physical to be to fundamental and consciousness emerges from the physical whereas my preferred view panpsychism does it the other way around right we take consciousness to be fundamental 
and the physical world arises from underlying facts about consciousness. But either way you do it, it's, it's good for parsimony, right? Because you're just taking one kind of thing as fundamental instead of what the dualist does, taking two kinds of things as fundamental. Does that make sense? Okay, so at long last, explain panpsychism <laughs> and how, how, uh, what reasons are there to favor it uh, compared to materialism? So, yeah, so we, I mean, one way into this, we've been <clears throat> trying for a long time now, several decades at least, to explain consciousness in terms of totally non-physical processes in the brain, and I think we've got precisely nowhere. The panpsychist... Sorry, you mean totally physical? You mean totally physical? Ex ex what did I say? Processes in the brain? I think you said non-physical. Oh, sorry. Well spotted. Uh, yeah. Yes, I did mean that. So we've been trying, as the materialist wants to do, to explain consciousness in terms of purely physical properties, processes in the brain, and we've got nowhere. The panpsychist proposes turning that whole explanatory project on its head, right? So instead of starting with physics and physical science and trying to get consciousness out of that, instead we start with consciousness, and try and get physics out of underlying facts about consciousness. It turns out that that's actually surprisingly easy to do. <laughs> and, uh, and here we bring in um, the, the really important work from the 1920s by the philosopher I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, and Nobel laureate Bertrand Russell. Um, I, I think we should think of Russell as the Darwin of consciousness. I think he really solved all the mysteries here. And um, for various historical reasons, his very important work on consciousness in the 1920s got forgotten about for a long time. And, but it's recently, in the last 10, 15 years, been rediscovered in academic philosophy and has inspired this return to a sort of Bertrand Russell-inspired version of panpsychism. Um, okay, so shall I give you the basic idea? Yes, please do. So... So yeah, it sounds kind of weird. At the f how do you get physics out of consciousness? What the hell is that all about? But so what? Really, what Russell was thinking about was again uh, kind of something we've al already d touched on. He was just spending a lot of time thinking of the, the the fact that our fundamental science is purely mathematical, which you know I, we sort of take for granted, but it's in a way it's quite a it's 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 quite a peculiar thing now you know of course as a working scientist it's very useful that science is mathematical you can get very precise predictions but russell's thinking what does it mean as a philosopher interested in the ultimate nature of reality that our most fundamental science is just equations it's just maths or math as you americans say um <laughs> we because we say it plural maths uh anyway yeah. but um never understood that yeah well we say physics don't we, we don't say physic i don't know it doesn't matter anyway um so <laughs> what russell thinks what russell thought it meant is that actually our our fundamental science isn't really telling us anything at all about fundamental reality it's merely describing its mathematical structure as far as physics is concerned ultimate reality could turn out to be anything, right? The only constraint physics imposes is that it has this mathematical structure. So whatever's going on at the fundamental level of reality, as long as it has the right mathematical structure, you're going to be able to get physics out of that. So this was Russell's insight. And panpsychists, contemporary panpsychists, exploit this in the following way. So the hypothesis is what we've got at the fundamental level of reality are maybe networks of very simple conscious entities interacting in very simple, predictable ways because they're very simple conscious entities. Through the simple interactions, they form certain patterns, certain mathematical structures. And then the, th then the claim is those mathematical structures just are what we call physics. So in that way, you get physics out of underlying facts about consciousness. This, it's often given this, um, I like to give, this famous line from 
the last page of Stephen Hawking, Brief History of Time, where he said, you know, even the final theory of physics will just be a bunch of equations. It won't tell us what breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe. So for the panpsychist, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. So the basic idea is, you know, we, we, can't, get, we can't get consciousness out of physics, but actually we can get physics out of consciousness quite easily. We, we know that can be done. So um, that's, that's, that's the expansion project that works out. So when you say that um, that the, the the fundamental reality of the universe is just a bunch of equations, um, you know, one point I've I've heard people make is the equations of physics, while they include time as an important variable, don't say anything about whether time has to run forwards or backwards, and yet it seems that time only runs in one direction. At least that's how we experience it, right? But in principle, all of the equations we know of would be compatible with the universe where every, uh, you know, with the Christopher Nolan um, Tenet universe where it's like the the world is just operating according to the laws of physics but in rewind, mm-hmm. right? Is that is that um, at all related to the point you're making about the distinction between the the equations and the reality? Yeah, it's uh, well, it's it is certainly related, and it's a fascinating problem. I suppose, I mean, I suppose different physicists would react to this in different ways. Some people, many physicists, such as Sean Carroll or my friend uh, Barry Lower, uh, Rutgers University, would um, would try to give a sort of reductive account of what you're talking about—the direction of time, maybe in terms of increasing entropy or something. Um, but other physicists, like uh, Lee Smolin, who, um, who who has some very interesting ideas. Actually, I, I, I recently won some money to try and work out if the spend three years trying to work out if the universe is conscious, and we're going to have a uh, a conference in 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 the U.S. in September. Actually, bringing together some leading physicists who put consciousness at a fundamental level at the fundamental level in their theories, um, and um, Sean Carroll and I are going to be debating at that event. Actually, but anyway, um, so so. Sh- the reason I'm linking to Lee Smolin, not only does he think consciousness plays a role in fundamental physics, but also time. He's very passionate on real time. And he makes the link, kind of a similar link I've made to Galileo, you know, where Galileo took consciousness out, thought, you know, let's just focus on the mathematics. He thinks Galileo also took, in a sense, took time out. When we math- mathematize nature, we took time out. And he wants to have a theory of physics that puts in the fundamental passage of time back in. Of course, that's ver- that's very controversial. So, um, where are we up to? Anyway, yes. Yeah, so, look, what we what is less controversial is that what you get from physics is mathematics, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe so mater- for materialists, materialists are like, yeah, that's all there is, right? The fundamental story is this story we can just completely describe in mathematics. And everything else comes out of that. Time, if it exists, consciousness, you know, plasticine, orange juice, everything comes out of that. Um, now, my claim further, is... Though, wouldn't, they say, wouldn't they say the mathematics suggests that we live in a quantum universe at the, at the most fundamental level? Yeah, but when, what is quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is is also a bunch of equations. It's it's the Schrodinger equation being the fundamental one. So when you look at what does physics have to? I mean, you, you, you're 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 a good philosopher here. So, so you know to qualify it slightly, it's not just mathematics. Arguably, there's also some causal notions in um, in physics. It's disputed, actually, whether you have causation in physics itself. This is another thing mm-hmm. Russell focused on. But certainly you have things like a law of nature, w- which is not just a mathematical notion. So, so you have some sort of causal notions in there. But So you can capture that by saying it's purely quantitative. We have this purely quantitative story of sort of mathematical causal processes. Um, my claim is that cannot be the fundamental story of reality 
because if it were you wouldn't have consciousness you could you can't get subjective quality as galileo understood you can't get subjective qualities of colors and sounds and smells and tastes out of just mathematical structure it can't be done that's why galileo said you know if we want physics to be mathematical we have to take consciousness out of the story so you ca- i just think you can't that theory cannot be true because if it were consciousness wouldn't exist but you can do it the other way around i think russell proved that starting with consciousness you can get mathematical structures of physics out of that so you can't get physics out of, you can't get consciousness out of mathematical structures but you can get mathematical structures out of consciousness so that's why i think you know comparing these two explanatory projects materialism and panpsychism that are sort of the mirror image of each other i think the materialist one we've never had any success at there are good philosophical theories philosophical reasons to thinking it's just an incoherent project whereas mm-hmm. the panpsychist project we the mysteries have been solved we know how to do it it feels a bit weird but it's sort of so no-brainer. i think i've understood everything you said in this conversation except for how we get uh the, the your actual description of your panpsychism i don't actually understand what you mean when you say mathematical structures you know like there is an i guess an uh, an emergent phenomenon that comes from mathematical mathematical structures that just sorry that comes from conscious entities that just is the mathematical structures can you can you uh give another go at that for me and try to explain that in, in yeah. some other way yeah in, fair in enough way. fair enough so so this is what i mean i i this is what uh my my phd supervisor galen strawson who's another very good panpsychist you suppress you know that we we think we know what matter is we have this sense that you know it's this stuff and you know it's hard and it's it's but actually as science has progressed as it as as it were the substance of matter has sort of evaporated Gail, galen strawson who i just mentioned calls this the silence of physics you know it, physics tells us less and less. you know we used to think in victorian physics you know we got these little solid billiard balls but then as science has progressed and quantum mechanics and really we lose any understanding beyond the equations so so mm. we don't we don't really here's another way of putting it we we don't really know what matter is all we know is what it does actually this is i guess another way of putting the same point physics doesn't tell us what matter is it tells us what it does like think you know what does physics tell us about an electron right well it tells us it has mass it tells us it has charge Okay, what what are mass and charge? Well, things with mass attract other things with mass. That's gravity. And things with mass resist acceleration. The the more mass something has, the harder it is to accelerate it or slow it down. Um, What's charge? Well, things with opposite charges attract. Things with like charges repel. It's all about what stuff does, right? It's just about behavior. It's not really telling us what an electron is. It's just telling us what it does. I sometimes say physics is like playing chess when you don't care what the pieces are made of, right? You just care what they do, right? So mm-hmm. so whatever's it, so physics doesn't care what's at the fundamental r- level of reality. It just cares that it's doing the right stuff. So the panpsychist posed this, right, fine. So what there is at the fundamental level of reality, on our view, are these little conscious entities and they are doing what the equations of physics says things at the fundamental level are doing. As long as they're doing the right stuff, you're going to get physics out of that. So, like, it, it, to, so is that is know, that is that the same as saying that like my camera's slipping? I think like so. quarks are quarks are ju- just our conscious. Is that or are there some other entities that physics has not yet named that are more fundamental than all of the fun most fundamental particles? particles physics has named right so there is there's an important question we don't know the answer to in the background here which is what what are the fundamental physical things and famously physics is not complete we don't know how to marry our best theory of big things namely general relativity to our best theory of 
very little things, namely quantum mechanics. Um, on our current models, the quarks and electrons are, and 10 other kinds of particle are the fundamental building blocks. But actually, many physicists, theoretical physicists, are inclined to think that actually the fundamental constituents of reality are not little particles, but universe-wide fields. This seems to fit better with quantum field theory. And particles are just local excitations in those fields. Um, so if you combine this view with panpsychism, then we get the view that, that the fundamental forms of consciousness underlie these universe-wide fields um, rather than little conscious things. But in either case, the f physics is just telling us Basically, physics says this, right? There are these things, and they do such and such. The panpsychist says, but, it, but, but, but physics doesn't tell us what the things are that are behaving in such and such way. It just tells you how they're behaving. It doesn't tell you what they are. Panpsychism plugs in an answer to what they are. So, it, it, in a way, it fills in and a gap. And it says that they are, the they are conscious entities. Yeah. So an electron, let's, for the sake of simplicity, think about electrons. An electron is just a conscious entity that behaves in the, it, you know, its entire nature is just being a conscious entity, but it does stuff. And what it does is what physics tells you an electron does. So, um, so you know. on this view, what explains the special at least the seemingly special consciousness that human beings and more complex animals seem to have yeah so so this is the next question i suppose so so what so what what i think is easy for a panpsychist is getting the physic physics out of consciousness which i think is quite an explanatory achievement right because we we just end up with one fundamental kind of thing we're back to the parsimony we've just got consciousness at the bottom i think that's a real expansion advantage but the thing that's trip maybe trickier for a panpsychist is okay okay so we've got the we've got physics but how do we get our consciousness out of you know we've postulated these little conscious quarks and electrons or whatever how do they come together to make the unified rich conscious experience of the human or animal brain this is what's become known as the combination problem and this is really where the uh you know much of the energy and focus of the contemporary panpsychist research program is 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 directed and there are all sorts of w varied and really interesting proposals uh, my my own view on this matter is i i, I I've become more and more inclined to think that the problem is only really a serious problem if you if you assume a very reductionist picture of nature. If you think, you know, really, really there are just conscious particles and what we call Coleman's mind is just is just the name for a very complex combination of conscious particles. So some some panpsychists, very good philosopher called Luke Roloffs got a book called Combining Minds, try to make sense of that very reductionist form of panpsychism. But I'm less and less inclined to think we've got any scientific reason to, to go that way. Um, so I, I, I think it's perfectly viable just to, just to postulate, again, kind of adding another primitive in a way, that these conscious particles have basic combinatorial capacities, basic capacities to in certain circumstances, combine into unified conscious wholes. And again, it's a, it, it will be a, an empirical question, right? So is the integrated information theory right? Or is the global workspace theory right? We're, we're back to that question. Mm -hmm. We answer the scientific question. Let's say it's integrated information theory. David Chalmers will say, okay, well, we, then we plug in the psychophysical laws I would say at that point, no, 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 no. Forget those psychophysical laws. That's not very parsimonious theory. We just go for conscious particles with these basic combinatorial capacities. So, so, integ so integrated information theory tells us 
you get consciousness in the brain when there's more integrated information in the whole and the parts. So the panpsychist will say conscious particles combine into unified wholes when they form a system where there's more integrated information in the in the whole and the parts. So so that would right. be yeah, more or less my kind of complete panpsychist theory. I mean very very, very, very roughly. No, no, that I I mean it it makes <laughs> Well, what I can say is it makes as much sense as the, at least as much sense as the alternatives. I can, I can, I'll I take that. that. I'll take that. I mean, you know, panpsychism <laughs> for a long, long time was laughed at insofar as it was thought about it at all. And it is incredible yeah. how it's come to be. You know, when I finished, first finished my PhD, I was told by well-meaning professors, yeah, maybe don't talk about that panpsychism stuff. You know, you might not get a job. And... It's amazing how it's become a mainstream position that you learn at university, you have to take seriously. It's, it's still very much the third option, you know. Materialism and dualism are still more popular, but it's it's taken very seriously. So I, I'm happy if you think it's a, it, make, it makes as much sense. At least. Maybe more. Um, should better. I worry that I am bullying my chair and my <laughs> table right now uh, by sitting on conscious entities with such <laughs> lack of care. No. So that may, this is another common um, misconception of panpsychism that maybe I should have started with. That Panpsychists don't necessarily think absolutely everything is conscious, right? They don't necessarily think tables and chairs and rocks and socks are conscious. Even though actually that's the meaning of the word. Pan means everything. Psyche means conscious or mind. But uh, so the, t the, the basic commitment is that the fundamental building blocks of reality, whether they're fundamental particles or whether they're uni universe-wide fields, the basic building blocks of reality have very rudimentary forms of consciousness. And then in certain, perhaps very limited circumstances those conscious building blocks come together to form things with unified consciousness like the human or the animal brain. But um, I'm inclined to think that probably doesn't happen in tables and chairs. Probably natural selection, as it were, worked this out and exploited it. I talk a lot in my new book about the evolution of consciousness. Um, so probably outside of the biological realm, I would say consciousness is, is just at the level of fundamental physics. But, um, yeah. And actually, well, some, I mean, some panpsychists do think literally everything is conscious. I mentioned Luke Roloffs, who has this very reductionist That's picture. interesting because, like, you, you, you'd have to – even that wouldn't get you out of all the questions because, you know, my chair is made up of chair legs and a chair head and – how do you define everything there? Is the leg independently conscious, independent of the chair? And how and what separates a half a chair from a quarter of a chair from a third of a chair? Are all of these separate entities? So Luke, you should get Luke Roloffs on to talk, who is, uh, an, an inc I mean, spends a lot of time on these exact issues. Um, mm. uh, I mean, his book is more an academic book if, you know, people ha listening or watching haven't got that background but he's written a lot, a lot of very good popular articles as well including in a book um there was a, a book called is consciousness everywhere which was responses of scientists and philosophers to my work um including by some big physicists like carla ravelli and um sean carroll but yeah um so but yeah he's a very rigorous philosopher i don't like having luke in the audience at a talk because he always has incredibly difficult questions. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think, he, as I say, he has this very reductionist picture where really your mind just is a complex collection. You, you feel like you're this special unified I, but really you're just a complex collection of conscious particles. And so to ask, um, okay, what's the, um, what's the connection between the, like, the consciousness of the top half of the cup and the consciousness of the bottom half of the cup. Um, is that the same as the consciousness of the whole of the cup? Or 
He'd say that's just, well, that's just like, you know, there's the mass of the top half and the mass of the bottom half and then the mass of the whole cup. But it's just kind of additive. You know, there's just, there's no real deep special way of carving up this into into a single reality. Um, but even then, even, so he literally does think tables and chairs are conscious, but he would quickly say they don't have the kind of consciousness you or I have, which is the result of millions of years of evolution. You know, they're just a, some kind of meaningless, disunified mess. It's only in the human brain that's been brought together into complex information processing, drawing in information from the environment and negotiating in, in terms of behavioral interactions with the environment. So that's the kind of rich conscious understanding we have. Um, but yeah, that's not the kind of picture I have anyway. I, I, I do think humans and animals are a little bit special in that it's not that often conscious particles combine to make a conscious whole. And the implication of this would be that substrate independence is true, which means there's nothing special about you know, carbon-based life or about the kinds of mm. atoms we have in our brain, right? Like, in, in principle, consciousness could be built um, in, in in silicon, right? Whether or not our computers currently are, no? It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, s certainly panpsychists don't think consciousness is something magical or mysterious. It's not something mm -hmm. put into the fetus by God at some point in conception in uh, pregnancy um so in principle we should be able to build artificial consciousness um at this ai summit i was just at and people were going around saying you know when are we going to get agi when are we going to get artificial consciousness all the tech people were saying you know the next 10 minutes and i i estimated five thousand years for artificial consciousness <laughs> but uh uh scientists and philosophers but um why did but, that where did that come from where did that that estimation yeah uh i guess i well so I, I, yeah i read an article out with the uh the conversation recently which is um an article in uh, uh, an online magazine in the uk to get kind of academic research to a broader audience and yeah i mean i'm basically just i i don't think um you're going to get consciousness from more and more complex information processing um impressive as large language models are i don't think they're conscious i don't and in that sense i don't think they really understand anything in the sense of consciously apprehending truths about reality um so i don't think you're going to get consciousness in that way if we're thinking of artificial consciousness i think we should be envisaging something more like an artificial living system something like um a bacterium in the first instance and then maybe maybe few few thousand years we'll get something as complicated as a human being but i think it's going to be a pro slow process it's not going to be just you know getting complex information processes um so so i don't know about substrate independence uh, you know maybe you have to have quite specific sort of stuff to get consciousness at least at least quite specific structures um but yeah it's not magic so yeah so in principle you're going to be able to make it yeah okay i've kept you longer than i said i would i'm gonna let you go but before i do uh can you tell my audience where to follow you website twitter handle etc and can you tell them about your latest book Absolutely. It's been a really fun chat, Coleman. Thank you. Uh, I do spend too much time arguing on Twitter with at Philip underscore Goff, Philip with one L, uh, if you want to have an argument there. I have my own po podcast and YouTube channel, Mind Chat, which I run with another philosopher, Keith Frankish, who has the polar opposite opinion to me. He thinks consciousness, in some sense, is an illusion. So I... I I think oh yeah, the, is that is, the Dennett, the Daniel Dennett position, right? Yeah, he's very much a Dennettian, and so we mm. we uh, interview scientists and we got we got very low production values because uh, we're busy professors that don't have time. We just, but uh, hopefully, some good philosophy. And um, 
website philipgoffphilosophy.com need to update that soon but there's a lot of videos and popular articles academic articles my new book um is on a yeah come slightly different theme although there's some continuity um coming out with oxford university press in november arguing that the universe has a purpose <laughs> called uh why the purpose of the universe so um so i guess um Everyone, I mean, everyone thinks they have to... I always hate the dichotomies. I always hate the dichotomies, you know. Materialism, dualism, we've been talking about. Uh, you know, communism, US capitalism. Another one is God or Dawkins atheism, you know. Which, it's always kind of, which side are you on? Dawkins or the Pope, you know. And I, I've just slowly come to think there's problems with both of these. Classic atheism and classic belief in god so i think um i think there's things traditional western religion can't explain like the evil and suffering why would a, the classic problem why would a loving god create the horrific suffering earthquakes cancer and so on but i think there's also things traditional atheism struggles with such as the the surprising discovery of recent decades that physics is as we have it at the moment, at least, appears to be fine-tuned for the existence of life. Um, I think I, I kind of think this is something we're a little bit in denial about because it wasn't how we expected science to turn out. And also certain facts about the evolution of consciousness. Why didn't we evolve as zombies? So what I'm arguing for is that there is some kind, there is evidence. We should be open-minded. We should look at the evidence. And I've been persuaded there's some kind of goal-directedness at the fundamental level of reality but it's not the traditional God, and I explore a variety of other possibilities. Maybe the, maybe maybe we're in a computer simulation. Maybe there's a bad designer or a designer of limited powers. Or maybe there's, as Thomas Nagel argued, there's, there's laws of nature with goals built into them. Maybe there's just a fundamental law of nature directing things towards life or something. Or maybe this connects closer with my... Uh, the work we've been talking about, cosmopsychism, maybe the universe itself is a conscious entity with certain goals. Um, and then I discuss the implications for human existence. So yes, um, that was a bit of a long ramble, but maybe we, maybe I could come back on and talk to you about that. It's, so I'm aiming, it's, it's aimed at a, absolutely, my first absolutely. book. My first book was an academic book. My second book was aimed at a general audience. This I'm trying to do both. So each chapter has a more, it's, it's, aimed at a general audience so it's a it's affordable as opposed to academic books but each chapter has a accessible bit and then a digging deeper bit where it kind of goes more into the detail so probably it'll please nobody but uh so yeah i'm very excited that's going to come out it's, it's actually coming out in february in the u.s which is a bit annoying it's uh november oh, in the okay. uk and february in, i don't know why there's a big gap but um but yeah so maybe we could have a chat about that so that should be absolutely. That's I will have to have you back for that. Annoying everyone because no uh, annoying religious people and atheists because saying they're both wrong. Cool. Well, that's a goal on this show to annoy as many people as possible. So it'll it'll fit right in. Excellent. Yeah, it's been All really right, nice. All right, Philip chatting. Goff, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Coleman. Take care. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always. Thanks for watching, and feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.